Let me remind you what we were doing last time. Our goal was to prove uh, this uh, optimal error bound. So we want to prove that theta, which is equal to g minus m, we want to prove this. This was our goal. And, um, and we basically did all, did all of the work. So we, um, we did it by, by considering the polynomial P of G, which was the following polynomial. And last time, what we proved, so last time, we proved that um, this polynomial of G, if we take the, the 2P, uh, the L2P norm of this polynomial, we prove that this thing is uh, bounded by some, some constant that depends on P. We don't really care how it depends on P times uh, the 2P norm of some random variable X. where x is uh, equal to this is okay so this is I think this is where we stopped last time, and then um, then four. So we did this, in fact, to be honest. We only did it rigorously for H being the GOE matrix. So we did this under the assumptions that the entries are Gaussian. I will return to this assumption in a few minutes. Before I do that, I would like to show how to conclude. Uh, the, the estimate. So this is a nice estimate. So we, are, we have estimated the 2p norm of this polynomial in terms of the 2p norm of some other random variable. So what have we gained? Well, we have gained in that this random variable is a much simpler object and in fact we know it to be small. And what we would like to deduce from this is that uh, p of g is in fact small with very high probability less than or equal to uh, x with very high probability. This you cannot do. From such an inequality, you can think about it. This is now some very elementary probability theory. If you have a random variable x and you have another random variable, or let me say, if you have a random variable p and you have another random variable x, and you know that the LP norm of, of capital P is bounded by the LP norm of x, you cannot deduce anything about the relative sizes of p and x. That's just, there's no way of doing it. These kinds of arguments usually go by, by Chebyshev's inequality. And there it's important that the thing, the, the thing with which you estimate, so the upper bound, is deterministic. So what we have to do, we, that's a slight, a slight nuisance, which is not difficult at all, is we have to replace x by a deterministic number, which behaves exactly like x. So that's, in fact, easy to do. So in order. The observation is, so why is x random? It's random because of this theta. Okay? And we know, we know from before, we proved the weak law, we proved that theta, so we know that theta is bounded by n to the minus one quarter. We would like to increase this exponent one quarter to one. So let's call this exponent sigma. We introduce a general exponent, and we assume that theta is bounded by n eta to the minus sigma. So let me choose a sigma which is, say, between 1 quarter and 1. It could be between 0 and 1, in fact. but. Uh, Okay, let me put in 0 and 1. And um, and suppose that theta uh, 
is stochastically dominated by n eta to the minus sigma, so that which implies that x now x is going to be stochastically dominated by a deterministic parameter that I call phi sigma. And phi sigma is nothing but this guy here, where you replace theta with uh, this upper bound here. So by definition, So that's my definition of phi sigma. So these expressions, they look somewhat lengthy, but uh, actually it's important to keep really these, these for, these, the form of these expressions. You will see, uh, in fact, later today and next week, how this form uh, is, is important for the, the major applications we want to draw from uh, this result. So, so from this, we deduce that the LP norm of this is stochastically dominated uh, by phi sigma. This is, if you wish, if you want to do this completely honestly, it's a little exercise. Right, so so you start from here, and we know that x is stochastically dominated by the, uh, theta sigma. You have to check, and there's a small thing to be checked, that if this holds, then the same thing holds also if you take the expectation. Right? So this is, this is you can take the two-piece two power of this, and this is just going to be the expect. So this, of course, this immediately implies, so this thing is the same as x to the 2p is stochastically dominated by sigma, uh, theta sigma to the 2p. This is trivial. But now in order to deduce this thing, we have, want to take the expectation on both sides and, and make sure that this thing is compatible with expectation. This is true. Um, and uh, if you want to make, I will not do it for you. It's a two-line exercise. You just have to play around a bit with, with, uh, with these um, with the definition of the stochastic domination. So I'll leave that as an exercise if you wish. Basic, basically, you have to partition your probability space into two events. One is the good event on which the estimate, on, this, on which this estimate holds. So this is a good event. This has very high probability. And then you have the bad event as well. And, um, and you have to fit basically the exercises, you have to figure out what to do on the band event. Okay, and now we can apply Chebyshev. Now we can use Chebyshev. We can use Chebyshev's inequality so, um, to deduce that P of G. So get rid of the expectations. Okay, I was. I hope this is clear. So how, how do you do that? So the probability. So you pick an epsilon, and then the probability that p of g is greater than or equal to n to the epsilon times um, n to the epsilon times theta phi. This now by Chebyshev. This is bounded by the uh, LP norm 2p to the 2p over n to the 2p epsilon. Well, let me write it like this n to the epsilon to 
to P. Right? So this is an application of Chebyshev. This is Chebyshev. And, um, and now I use this guy here. This is precisely by this inequality. So if I call this star, this is by star. This is bounded by uh, n to the epsilon times You give yourself, let's say you give yourself a D, a positive D and a positive epsilon. This is what you have to do to verify this, this condition here. And, um, and you apply Chebyshev, and now you just use this fact, this stochastic domination. Now you get a single n to the epsilon, or you could have any other number. You could have an n to the delta or something, or n to the, even n to the 1, it doesn't matter. The point is that by choosing P to be sufficiently large, in the denominator, you can make this exponent as big as you wish, and therefore you can reach any d here by choosing the d again. And this is precisely this condition here. Okay, so by using Chebyshev, you can obtain exactly what you wanted. The crucial thing in this in this application of Chebyshev is that this is a deterministic number. You could not do this if if phi sigma were a random variable. Okay, is this? Is this all right, everyone? Does that make sense? So this is the conclusion of the estimate. This is also the main work. Now, before, before seeing, uh, telling you how to use this, this estimate to, to conclude the proof of the theorem we are trying to prove, which is a relatively uh, simple matter, I would like to go back to this assumption of GOE and make a remark about more general Wigner matrices. Basically, so this is a remark on, uh, on general non-Gaussian So recall, how did the argument go? We, we had, a, just to go back, where did we use the assumption that our matrix was Gaussian? We were estimating and we used this cumulant expansion to write this Now, I forgot whether I used n or n minus 1. Let me try to be consistent. Um, n. Okay. n. So this was the structure, and these were these explicit terms where, where in 8k, Maybe I will not write up again the definition of 8K. You, you, I, I hope you have it uh, if, you, if you wrote down what we did last time. Um, so the point was that in the GOE case, um, A, the 8Ks are 0 from K uh, equal to 2. So A2, A3, A4, and so on, they're all 0. The remainder term is also 0. And so what we had to deal with was A0 and A1. And, and that gave us this. So in general, if A2 and A3 and A4 and so on, they are non-zero. In fact, in fact, the argument gets easier. So the, the ideas are much easier. The only difficulty is figuring out how to write down in a rigorous way the resulting algebra. 
And this can be done without any troubles whatsoever. It's just not very exciting, so I will not give you the details. Um, but I will explain the idea. The idea is very simple. So now these things are non-zero in general. So if you have a general non-Gaussian matrix, then the cumulants of order 3 and above are not necessarily zero, unlike in the Gaussian case. And, and you actually have to estimate them. So it turns out they're all small, so they don't contribute to anything. So, so we use exactly the same approach. The same The same approach. You use two ingredients. So there are two key ideas that, that kind of show almost immediately how this approach is going to work. The first one, if you recall, in AK, we have, uh, we have a cumulant of order K plus 1 of the entry HIJ. And these cumulants, by homogeneity, you recall cumulants, cumulants are homogeneous. So the k plus first cumulant uh, is homogeneous of degree k plus 1 in this random variable. And these random variables were 1 over square root of n times some random variable that lives on the scale 1. So this guy is going to be of order So as k increases, these things become increasingly small. So we did the case k is equal to 1, where this was 1 over n. And this was required precisely to compensate one of the summations in here. But if you go beyond that, then you get extra factors of 1 over square root of n, extra powers of 1 over square root of n, which will make things small. And, and the other observation is you use the ward identity. Whenever you have sums over i and j, you use this uh, ward identity Um, and each time you use the ward identity, if you recall, you get factors. You get factors of uh, imaginary part of G over A nata. That's precisely what the ward identity gives you. You see, these are these are the kinds of factors that go that go in here, for example. Um, so if you recall. Basically, this you should view this this um, x. In fact, more precisely, my my x. If you recall what this x was, I will write it like this. This was my x. And the origin of these terms in this argument is this, this term comes from uh, always from this ward identity. So this comes from the imaginary part of G over n eta. This is, this is just the trivial upper bound of that, right? You, you write G is equal to m plus G minus m. G minus m is this guy. And this one, if you recall, came from um, came from p prime. Um, and this is, this, is, this is basically how these, these two factors came about. And then in, in general, so you can imagine there's, a, there's an algebra you have to differentiate if you recall it. G, J, K. You have to compute these derivatives, and you get a host of terms, and you have to calculate how many derivatives of p do you get, uh, and how many factors of gij, what is the index structure, and so on. It looks a bit complicated. In reality, it's not. So if you wish, I mean, this is something you can even figure out yourself. It would take you maybe half a day or a day. You have to find some way of bookkeeping these, these things. Uh, and, uh, and that is really an exercise in bookkeeping. 
I will not do this to you because it's, it goes, uh, I think it would take us too far into this more technical direction, but it's not something that's particularly difficult. So if you, if you really care about this, you can do it yourself. It's, it's, not a, it's not a deep thing. There's nothing more to doing the estimates than these two things, and it's an exercise in bookkeeping. Exercise in bookkeeping in, in mathematical physics these exercises, they come up a lot. So one could argue that a, a significant proportion of mathematical physics is figuring out how to organize complicated expansions. This is a big, big topic in mathematical physics, statistical mechanics. Um, this is one example of how such things come up. There are many other famous examples, cluster expansions and all that. And, and the basic principle is always the same. You have an algebra which is in principle very simple. However, you have to bring it to quite high orders and, um, and then you have to find some coherent way of expressing all of the terms you get. Um, so this is one, one such example. I would rather not do it for you also because it's actually not very enlightening to see it. Um, so let me just write what this requires. keeping of all terms and and rn the remainder term rn if you take the estimate we had on rn if you choose n to be sufficiently large it's going to be very easy to see that it's tiny you can take you can take your n for example to be equal to 2p and then it's sort of, it's going to be tiny, but for a trivial reason, so Rn. Again, uh, it's just not very much fun to write it up, but there's nothing hard going on. So we were, we were for example, uh, last time I think we discussed, or well, I mentioned Feynman diagrams, which you may have heard about. If you've studied high energy physics or, or statistical physics a bit, you will have seen them. And, and they are nothing but a graphical way of organizing uh, such, such a thing. So they pop up in many, many different areas, originally in high energy physics, the theory of QED. Um, but they pop up in many other areas, field theories, statistical mechanics. And the problem is always the same. The problem is you have, in principle, a very simple algebraic procedure that you use to expand something. It gives you many, many terms, and the terms start becoming a bit complicated. So you find an alternative way of uh, bookkeeping them. And one way to do that is using diagrams. One could also use diagrams here, but it's not even needed. Okay, so, so, so with this explanation, I don't expect you to see that, I mean, the proof is not obvious, one has to do it, but I hope if someone were, were to ask you to do it, you would at least know how to start. Right? You would start computing these derivatives, and then you would, as an exercise, you can, for example, if you wish to understand this a bit better, this is a good exercise, you can do the case k is equal to 2, you get a bunch of different terms, you can check them all out, and you will see that just using these two facts, it's easy to show they are all sufficiently small. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this? So this was a slightly more hand-waving part. Now I would like to return to a more rigorous discussion, concluding the proof of our main theorem. So let me summarize what we've understood so far. So I'll put this in a proposition. We have the following implication. So I would like to write it as an implication. If you know that theta is stochastically dominated by n eta to the minus sigma, then 
you know that P of G is stochastically dominated by phi sigma. That's what we just saw. Then, now we go back. Now we do what we did uh, in the proof of the weak law, exactly the same thing. If you know that P of G is bounded by something, you know that G, you know, you will get immediately bounds on this quantity. So this will imply by now lemma uh, lemma 24 we find that um, G minus M We do the stability analysis, again, exactly the same stability analysis of the roots of this quadratic polynomial P of G, and we find the following thing. Now, we face the same problem as before. We would like, we know that the minimum of these two is bounded by whatever we want it to be bounded by, um, and we want to make sure that it's in fact this one that's small and not that one. And the argument is a bootstrapping, exactly the same one as we did. I will not repeat it. You can follow it line by line by, by, uh, by making trivial modifications in, the, in the, the estimates. Before we had, before the quantity here was, uh, was 1 over square root of n eta, and now it's this quantity. Otherwise, it's exactly the same argument. So I will not repeat. But you have, I th you, you have no choice. You have to redo a bootstrapping again going down uh, exactly in the same way as before. Uh, and, and here you, you have to do this bootstrapping simply because otherwise you have no way of guaranteeing that you're always close to this guy. So by bootstrapping so just like in section 2.2 we find um, that you are in fact, that it's in fact this one that is estimated by the right hand side and this one is nothing but theta. So we get the following remarkable implication. This is what you get. So all that, you, all that happens here is in this, if you do this bootstrapping argument, which I leave as an exercise if you wish, if you would like to understand the bootstrapping argument very well that we did uh, last week uh, or two weeks ago, then this is a very good exercise to do uh, for yourself to repeat all the details for this case here. And this is a very remarkable estimate. It's, it's a so-called self-improving high probability estimate. Um, which you can actually also view as a form of bootstrapping, but maybe that's too grand a word. It, it's, it just tells you that if theta is estimated by this guy, which is, has a certain si size, then in fact theta is going to be estimated by this guy here, which is uh, much smaller. So this is something we will study now, but it's not hard to see that this right-hand side is much smaller than this, uh, this right-hand side. So you can probably guess what you do now. You start with some weak bound. We had n, uh, sigma is equal to one quarter. You run this once, and then you get a better bound, which is maybe still not optimal, and then you repeat. And we will repeat this. We will just plug, it, plug this estimate into itself a large number of times, and eventually the bound will converge towards a bound that is optimal. So this is a self-improving and 
these kinds of things, they occur very much in, in the study of random matrices, and they are, in general, very powerful tools if you can derive such a... So this is a powerful idea in, in random matrix theory, that you, you have a quantity and you make some weak assumption on this quantity, and then using this weak assumption, you derive a stronger uh, estimate on the same quantity, and then you can repeat it. Okay. So since, how do we conclude? Now this is just an elementary uh, observation. So remember this phi theta, it had this quantity imaginary part of m. And in fact, in fact this self-improving bound is a, is a very important bound. I will give it a name. Um, maybe I'll call it self-improving bound. We will return to it next week when we discuss eigenvalue rigidity, which is one of the main results of this, of this semester. Um, we, will, we will use it again, so we'll give it a name. Um, now, if you recall the imaginary part of M, we had an elementary lemma in, in, the, in this section that discusses this, this simple uh, quadratic, or the root of a quadratic polynomial. This thing was always bounded by some constant times square root of kappa plus eta. If you recall, we had this elementary lemma, and this bound is always true. Now, for the purposes of what we are doing here, I can estimate this guy here, the, the fact the imaginary part of m in the definition of theta sigma just by square root of kappa plus eta. And then the two factors in, in here, they are the same. And um, I, get, I get the following thing. Is this all right? So I had to remember in the definition of phi sigma, I had two factors, and I estimate the imaginary part of m, which is in general smaller than that, but it's always bounded by that one from above. I estimate it by that, and then both factors become the same, and, uh, and I get that. Um, and I get, uh, so I get the following, of the, uh, following implication. So if theta is bounded by n eta to the sigma, then, well, theta is bounded by, by this guy here. Now, the theta sigma consists of two terms. Let me split it into two terms. If I take the first term, the square root of kappa plus eta over at n eta, um, this I take it in the numerator. And in the denominator, I certainly get an upper bound if I just forget about this uh, uh, phi, sorry, this is a phi sigma, right? I get an upper bound if I forget about the phi sigma, uh, and therefore the square root of kappa eta just cancels that one. So the first term, the first term, this one, if I divide it by square root of kappa plus eta, I just get one over an eta. The second one, uh, the second one, I don't have a kappa plus eta. So I'm using, here I'm using, let me write it like this. Here I'm using that x divided by kappa plus eta plus x is bounded by x divided by kappa plus eta. And here I will use that x divided by kappa plus eta plus x is less than or equal to the square root of x. Okay, so for this term, I, I forget, in the denominator, I forgot, forget about the uh, phi sigma. And for this term, I will forget about the kappa plus eta. So I will get, um, I will get a 1 over an eta to the power 1 plus sigma, and then I take the square root.
Is that right? So, um, and now this looks very much self-improving, right? So we are, we are aiming to prove that. So we know this is true, for example, when sigma is equal to one quarter, or let's be even rougher if sigma is equal to zero. Um, and we would like to prove that this holds with the optimal bound one over n eta. So iterate it once. If I set sigma to be zero after one iteration, here the exponent is one half, right? Okay, I do it again. If sigma is one half, the exponent is going to be three quarters, I think, right? And as you repeat, this, is, this exponent increases and converges towards one. And that's exactly what, what we would like to do. So let me write this down carefully. So iterate, let's iterate this in fact it's easiest to start with sigma is equal to zero to start with an even weaker bound so if you recall in proposition 20, we in fact proved it for sigma equals one quarter, but, uh, but we can, uh, which in particular implies it holds for sigma is equal to zero. So if we get So if you do this if you do this carefully, I think that's the exponent that you get. If you iterate this n times, so the exponent is going to be the sum of two to the minus k when k goes from one to n. And this you can just write it, you can perform, you can do the geometric series, right? If you do the geometric series. you get the following thing, n eta to the 2 to the minus n. So this is n starting number of iterations? Yes. Okay. N it's, not the, it's not the little n from the expansion. The oh, no, no. I mean, this is forgotten already. Uh, this was uh, ancient history about half an hour ago. We, we are doing something, something different now. I mean, once you, once you get this bound, once you get the bound on the polynomial p in high probability, then you can forget about the other little n. Um, okay, and this, now we can make, do a very rough bound, we can say uh, since eta is less than or equal, to, uh, eta is bounded by some, some constant, um, this is bounded by a constant times n 2 to the minus n, we get that. And now if you just recall the definition of stochastic domination, remember that there's always room for an arbitrarily small power of, of capital N. And if I just make, so I give myself an epsilon and then I choose my little n so that two to the minus little n is less than epsilon, um, I, I, can, I can show that this theta is in fact stochastically dominated by one over n eight. So choosing n large enough Um, and using the definition of, uh, of this and the stochastic domination, we deduce we deduce that theta is bounded by one over n eta. Okay. So this is how you get the final estimate. This was our goal. Now we are basically done. Um, 
to prove the main theorem of this semester, in fact. Uh, if you recall, if you go back to the statement of theorem uh, 11, that's the one we are proving, that was, so that was an estimate on theta, g minus m, that we just proved. That was also an estimate on gij, uh, but this follows immediately from this estimate and the basic estimates that we proved already a few weeks ago. Um, if you go back, it was called lemma 23, I think. They were the basic estimates. We were deriving estimates on, uh, on, uh, on G, on Gij, max i not equal to j. And we were proving things like that. Um, and then we also had maximum i If you recall, we had an estimate of this kind in this lemma 23. And psi theta, one over imaginary part of n plus theta, n eta. And the thing that we wanted to obtain in theorem 11 was a bound This was the bound that we were aiming for, but now you observe if, if it, so this is something we already know. This was with the indicator function phi. But we know that phi now, thanks to this lo local law that we already proved, we know that phi is equal to one with very high probability. So that means this estimate holds also without the phi. And, um, and, and you see now that we know that theta is bounded by one over n eta, if you replace this theta with the 1 over n eta, you get precisely this psi here. So psi So psi with this notation, n eta to the minus 1, is comparable up to some factors of 2 uh, to the psi we had in theorem 11. We conclude um, and again to, to remind you that, that psi oops, it should be a zero. So one minus phi is uh, zero is equal to zero with very high probability. Uh, by, um, by proposition 20. Okay, so if you wish you can write this phi as, as this, is, this is equal to the one is what you want to estimate and this guy is equal to zero with very high probability. So you would get that on the right hand side and it just gives you a zero. Um, of course, this is a positive number. Uh, we conclude that lambda is bounded by psi. And this is the end of the proof. So this is the end of basically the first part of, of these lectures. That's the end of the proof of theorem 11, which was the main result of these lectures. And the rest, at least the next, uh, uh, at least this, the next month of November, is going to be about drawing all sorts of consequences uh, and applications from this uh, theorem 11. OK, so I think this is a good point to stop. So let's have a break here, and we'll continue in 15 minutes. OK, so let's. Now continue with the next chapter, which is about applications. 
So what can we deduce from this theorem? We worked quite hard now for, for uh, uh, over a month to, to prove it. And um, uh, as advertised, it has lots of fundamental implications in, throughout random matrix theory. That's the next section. Since, uh, aha, maybe by the way, as an aside, so since, since we are now in Geneva and we did talk about Feynman diagrams, uh, a few historical remarks. So Feynman, as you know, was a very brilliant and flamboyant extroverted person. So many of the things he's actually famous for were not invented by him. And in particular, Feynman diagrams were invented before by Stückelberg, who was a physicist in Geneva, a very eminent physicist in Geneva. And he really invented them, I mean, in the form that Feynman became famous for. And Feynman knew this and even acknowledged it. Uh, but somehow, Stückelberg was a, was a somewhat reclusive uh, the exact opposite personality of Feynman, and, uh, and so they became known as Feynman diagrams. Does it, what else is Feynman famous for? Anyone have an idea? Feynman cuts formula. Yes. So Feynman cuts formula, which is a uh, Feynman. Uh, Feynman's name appears on it because he invented it. Comes from the functional integral representation in quantum mechanics, which you may know about. Uh, or the path integral formulation of, of quantum mechanics. And this was not invented by Feynman either. This was invented by Dirac, who was English, but born uh, in Switzerland, in the near Geneva uh, as well, in the Romandie. So, um, so, there's, so the things Feynman is famous for, in fact, originate in this part of Switzerland. Okay, these are historical remarks. You can read, in fact, there's, a, there's an old paper of Dirac, I've forgotten the title, which is quite short, it's beautiful, and if you read it, you will be shocked, because you see that he, he really comes up precisely with the, the Feynman path. Okay, anyway, that's uh, enough about history. So let's now, uh, I would like to give three uh, <coughs> fundamental applications of this, uh, of this uh, uh, local law. I will start with the most basic one, which will serve, in fact, also as a tool to prove the second one, and the second one will serve as a pro tool to prove the third one. Um, and that is, well, it's usually called the semicircle law on small scales or something. And um, so what is, what is that? It is, it is an immediate or relatively immediate consequence. It compares, so if you recall, going back to the very first lecture, we, have, we had the measure mu, which was the empirical eigenvalue measure of, of my matrix. So this is just the eigenvalue counting measure. It puts a delta mass at the location of every eigenvalue. And we had rho, which was the semicircle. This was the semicircle. And we said that the semicircle law states that mu converges weakly to rho in probability as n tends to infinity. That's a weak statement. And now the next result is the strongest possible version of this statement. So the claim is that mu of i for any interval i is equal to rho of i plus an error of order 1 over n. For all intervals So this is a uniform high probability bound for any interval. And this is clearly the best you can hope for. I mean, you, 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 um, you can imagine if you choose, choose your semicircle law, you can choose your interval, i, maybe to be like this. You count the number of eigenvalues in here. And, um, and clearly, these eigenvalues, we know that they fluctuate. So if you want a high probability bound, you, you want to your bound cannot be so precise that it sees whether this, this eigenvalue is inside the interval or outside. It will jump in and out. 
and if he jumps in and out, this quantity will change by a factor 1 over n. Right, so the, the error cannot be, this a, approximation cannot be as precise as 1 over n. It has to be strictly less precise than 1 over n. And uh, so this is, in that sense, this is optimal. Okay, so that's the theorem. So let's prove it. So it's a very simple statement, the proof. I'm also giving it, well, because it's an important result, but the proof is also very instructive. It is a, it's a very important, this is a very important idea in spectral theory, which is if you understand the Stilges transform of some measure, how can you understand the measure itself? So going back, in some sense, inverting the Stilges transform. In this local law, theorem 11, we had very precise bounds. We know that G minus, so we know that G is equal to M plus, okay? And, uh, and if you recall G, for example, G was the integral mu dx x minus z. Okay, so if we, we have very good bounds on, on, on the Stilges transform of this measure mu, and what we would like to do now is we would like to integrate not with respect to this function 1 over x minus z, but we would like to integrate with, with respect to the indicator function. Uh, let me write it. Or should I write the indicator function? Indicator function. Okay, so this is the quantity we would like to understand, uh, the integral respect, with respect to an indicator function, and what we control very well is integrals with respect to 1 over x minus z. And the question is how to go back, how to go from these functions to these functions. And this is a central topic in, in spectral theory. There is a, um, there is a whole theory, um, which usually goes by the name of functional calculus, and the basic philosophy is very simple. You want to express any function, let's say function of lambda, as if you want a superposition of um, so you take a sum and in fact, usually this sum, maybe I shouldn't even write a sum, I will write an integral. Some kind of integral with some weights. So if we can express the function f as a superposition, any function f as a superposition of these kinds of functions, 1 over lambda minus z, just by varying the z, then we can transport bounds on, on these functions that we know. So if you now integrate with respect to lambda uh, with the measure mu, then you will get, uh, you see, if I take my f to be this function here, and I integrate with respect to mu over lambda, then, then I, on the left-hand side, I will get precisely mu of i, and on the right-hand side, I will get the Stilges transform of my measure. Um, I should probably not use g, sorry. This is confusing, let me use h. So the question is, can you represent any nice function as a superposition of these types of functions? And the answer is yes. Uh, there is a, maybe just as a background remark, so this is all just sort of remarks to give you a background of, of what we're going to do. One easy way to do that is if this function is holomorphic. And that's just Cauchy's integral formula. You know that f of lambda is equal to 1 over 2 pi i, 1 over 2 pi i uh, f of z. Um, maybe I will put in uh, I will put in a minus, <coughs> right? If f is holomorphic, so if, if f is analytic. So if f is analytic in a neighborhood of the point lambda, you take some contour. This is my point lambda. 
you take some positively oriented contour which goes around this point lambda which lies in the domain of analyticity of your function f then, then this formula is valid. Right? This is Cauchy's integral formula and I have achieved precisely what I wanted. Okay. Now this, this is very nice, this is a beautiful formula, it has lots of great applications. It has one big drawback is that f has to be analytic. Right? And in particular the f we are interested in is this one here and this is very far from being analytic. So usually uh, so you may, you may say, well, okay, this is really a, nice fun uh, really a nasty function. Maybe we can smooth it out a bit so we can have a smooth version of the indicator function. That's indeed something we will do. But even smooth indicator functions cannot be well approximated by analytic functions. So that's why this, this formula, although it has lots of great uses, is not really useful for us. And we are going to use a different functional calculus, which does the same thing. It always the same thing. So you express f any function f as a linear combination of these, these functions. If you want, it's a bit like Fourier analysis, except instead of taking the basis of plane waves, we take the basis of these resolvent type functions. And the functional analysis we're going to use is one based on the helfer sjöstrand formula, which was on the problem set for today. And that does the same thing. It has the great advantage that it does not require any analyticity. It just requires a C1 condition, as you saw. Uh, or C2, depending on how you use it. Uh, and that's a much more versatile tool, and this can be used to prove this theorem. So, let me start with the proof. So what we want to control is the difference of mu minus rho, so let me give this guy a name, let me call it hat. So the signed measure Is this clear, by the way, this discussion? I mean, this is just as a background. We're not using it for the proof, but I think it's good for you to know. So the background, uh, the, the signed measure mu hat is just going to be mu minus rho. So it's no longer a positive measure. It's, it's a real measure. It's, it's a signed measure. And the total, total variation, variation of this measure is 2. And, uh, uh, and it has total measure equal to 0. And g hat is the Stiltius transform of this measure mu hat. Which is of course equal to g minus m. So uh, maybe I should put in the arguments. So the idea, as I said, so estimate. And the philosophy here is that we, thanks to this theorem 11, we have optimal bounds on g minus m. And therefore, if this helfer sjöstrand formula is good enough, it should transport optimal bounds on the Stiltius transform to optimal bounds on indicator functions. And indeed, it does that. So in general, this, this health is just around the functional calculus is a very, it's a very good formula. It is very accurate. Um, the only drawback is you have to write down a few integrals uh, and you have to evaluate them, but it's never particularly difficult. You will see the arguments are not difficult at all. The only difficulty is in, in figuring out that you have to apply this formula. So we'll estimate mu hat of i using the, the health uh. so the health as formula is another one of these uh, these famous examples of a formula which bears the names of two people who I think are not actually responsible for the formula uh, I think they did not come up with it, but uh, that's just the way this is. I think, I mean, some of you are from Russia, right? So you, you, you know this, uh, I think it's a theorem due to Arnold, which says that theorems are never named after their inventors. I think this is known as Arnold's theorem. And I think the claim is that this theorem applies even to itself, if I remember well. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, this is what it's called. Um, 
using bounds. Uh, from theorem 11 on g hat. So theorem 11 gives us optimal bounds on g hat. So let's start. So we will fix. So we will need to integrate functions and be quite precise. So now we have to unpack the definition of, of this stochastic domination and all that. So let's give ourselves an epsilon. And I will work. I will take an eta, which is equal to minus 1, eight, n to the minus 1 plus epsilon. This is the smallest scale on which uh, this approximation from theorem 11 is valid. So in fact, it turns out it suffices basically. Basically, it suffices to do the whole argument for an interval which is in the, contained in the interval minus 3, 3. We will, at the end of the proof, we'll see how, how to deal with intervals outside of this this interval minus 3, 3, that's not going to be difficult. So let's assume the interval i is contained in minus 3, 3. So then the, we will choose, uh, so this is our indicator function. So we will choose a function that is this indicator function, except as I, as I said, Indicator functions themselves are just a bit too nasty. They are discontinuous and so on. So we will smooth it out. So we will choose a function that is smooth and compactly supported, but very close to this indicator function. In fact, basically, if you, in fact, the function we are choosing it can be chosen to be exactly the following. Uh, pick your favorite approximate delta function, smooth and compactly supported. So in other words, a compactly supported smooth function whose integral is equal to 1 and rescale it so that it's supported in the interval minus eta to plus eta and convolve this indicator function with that approximate delta function. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So I will, I will be less, uh, I will be more, exp somehow more pedestrian. So we will choose, choose an f which, so which depends on the interval and the scale eta. And I want this to be a C, so it's going to be it's a function that is, so this is smooth, C infinity, and compactly supported. And I want its values to lie in the interval 0, 1, such that Such that. I mean, you've all had basic courses on real analysis, so you know how to construct such functions. So f, uh, f of x is equal to 1 for x in i. So I want f of x to be equal to 1 for x in i. I want f of x to be equal to 0 for x. if I'm at a distance greater than eta from the interval i. And, um, and I will need bounds. This is the L infinity norm. So I will need bounds on the first and second derivatives of f. And the best I can hope for, so what's the best I can hope for here? The sharpest possible bound as a function of eta. 1 over eta, yeah. I can't do better than 1 over eta, maybe up to a constant. So, but this I can certainly do. And the same thing Okay, so this is what my function looks like. Well, let me not draw there. It doesn't really matter where the interval This is my interval i. So this is 1. 
Okay? This is my function. A little remark that's going to be very important. So this is for some constant. A little remark. So note. What can I say about the bound on what can I say on the uh, on the bound of the derivative of sorry of the integral of the absolute value of f prime? Does anyone have an idea what how does this thing behave as a function of eta? It's like a constant, right? Because I know this, I have this bound, but this the, the, the derivative is supported only in this interval of, of order eta, right? It's zero here and it's zero here. So this thing is bounded by a constant. Okay? And the same thing analogously if I integrate the second derivative I get a constant divided by eta as an upper bound. Okay? So these are facts we will use. So this is going to be my, uh, my function f. We will prove this approximation for this function f. And once we do that, because the scale eta is, is very small, uh, once we know it for this smooth indicator function, it's going to be easy to deduce the result for the actual sharp indicator function. Now, if you recall the Herfus-Jostrand formula, so you need a function f, which is defined on the complex plane, and it requires a cutoff function as well. So let me, so we aren't quite there yet. Um, let me first introduce a cutoff function. This cutoff function is very benign. So we will, we will now need to, let me draw a picture of the complex plane. This is now the complex plane. This is going to be the x-axis. This is going to be the y-axis. And my interval lies somewhere here, maybe. So my function f, for now, is just defined on the real line. OK? Now, the Helfer-Sjöström formula requires an integration over the whole complex plane, over x and y. And it requires a cutoff function to make sure that the integration in the y direction is also compactly supported, if you recall. So here the integration over x is, a, is going to be compactly supported in a trivial fashion, just because this, this function f is compactly supported. But I would like to choose a, a cutoff function uh, that I call pi that just ensures that the integration in the y direction is, is compactly supported. So I choose a chi uh, that is, again, smooth. And now it's enough to make it depend just on the y variable. So I choose it a function of a, of a real function and I, of, a, of a single real variable. And I choose it to be even. So chi of y is equal to chi of minus y. And um, such that. So here there's no scale. So chi of y is equal to 1 for So I choose it to be constant in this strip. I choose it to be, oops, well this, this strip should be symmetric ab about the real axis. So. I choose it to be constant in this strip, and then I choose it to decay slowly to zero when you go from one to two. Four. And moreover, So here there's no scale. This happens on a large scale. This happens on the scale 1. I don't have any eta and everything is nice and bounded. 
It would be sufficient for all of our purposes to choose a function which is one only on the real axis and it starts going to zero immediately after you leave the real axis. You will see, however, in the arguments, it's very important that we have a region around the real axis in which this function is constant. Because we will get some terms which contain, which, the, which are proportional to chi prime. And we would like to make sure that chi prime is supported way away from the, the real axis. You will see how that comes in. Okay, so now um, we, we still face the question of how to extend this, this f of x to the complex values. One obvious way to do that is just not to make it depend on y, right? You can get a smooth complex function that depends just on x. That, it turns out, for the estimates is not quite good enough, and we will use this is, a, this is one, uh, one powerful idea behind the many applications of this Helfer-Sjöström formula is to do a so-called, so uh, it's, um, it's an almost analytic extension of my function f. <coughs> so f is in general not an analytic function. If f were the restriction of an analytic function onto the real axis, then you know that there is a unique way to extend, to, to, to recover the function in the, in the complex plane, right? If you take an analytic function in the neighborhood of the real axis, you can recover it from its values on the real axis. Uh, but f might not be analytic at all. In fact, this f we chose is never going to be analytic. So, however, you can, you can do a so-called almost analytic extension, which has some properties similar to the analytic uh, extension, and in particular, the Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied on the real axis. So, so we extend f by its almost analytic almost analytic extension of And this, this, in fact, you can do this almost analytic extension up to various degrees. And we'll just do the one of degree one. And, and so what is it? It's very easy. So you take, you pretend that f is analytic and you write down the power series in y. So if, I, if you expand around, um, so in other words, you, you, you write down the Taylor series You write it like this, and you do a Taylor expansion in y. And it's the, the of all of degree k would just be the Taylor series of order k of this f at y. Right? So I'm just taking the degree 1, so that means it's plus i y f y of x. Okay? So now you know what the almost analytic extension is. You can go on further. There are many, or there are some applications where, in fact, it's important to go much further. Uh, in this expansion, for this, for these purposes, it's not. For these purposes, you will see it's enough to do just the first order expansion. And you can check, for example, on the real line, this function satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Then, so now let's write up what the Helfer-Sjöström formula tells us. For, for any real lambda, so you, I mean you had a look at this Cauchy-Riemann equation, right? I mean it was on the new problem set. You will discuss it also in the exercises today with Johannes. Um, and what it tells you, so let me write explicitly. So explicitly, if you recall, it involves this anti-holomorphic derivative. that you have to apply to the product of the function f times chi. So let me do this already explicitly. So I take out the factor 1 half. This is an integral over the whole complex plane. And then I have the anti-holomorphic derivative, which I apply to um, to this function. Okay. 
Okay, so this is an application of the, this is just the health of your strand formula. Is all right? If you look at, now you have it all fresh in your mind, hopefully, so you will, you will remember that this is exactly what you have, right? So you have the anti-holomorphic derivative of f times chi, and now the function f, the, comp, the, the smooth function on complex numbers that we are using, is this almost analytic extension of the f on the real axis. Okay, so let's, so this is basically the algebraic step. Now we have these derivatives which we have to compute. So let's compute the derivatives. Uh, we'll, maybe we can do two things at the same time. So of course these derivatives we have to compute. It's easy, you just apply the chain rule. We will do that and we will also um, so integrate integrating with respect to if I now take mu hat I take mu hat of d lambda and I integrate with respect to lambda, lambda on both sides. I get, I get f of lambda. So this was true for all lambda on the real axis, mu hat d lambda. That's equal to the left hand side. And the right hand side, you see the lambda, and this is the power of this functional calculus. The lambda, it decouples completely the function from lambda. The lambda appears just here. And if you integrate over lambda with respect to mu hat, you just get g hat, right? This, this denominator gives you g hat. And what remains is uh, one, so 1 over 2 pi dx dy. And then I have all of these derivatives that I, that I have to calculate. <coughs> And, um, and the integral over lambda just gives me a, a, a g hat of x plus i y. So let's compute these derivatives. So let's start. So we will have, I will write it like this. I will have a bunch of terms where I do not differentiate the chi. So let's write all of these terms together, the terms where I do not differentiate the chi. So I can, I can differentiate Let's first do the x derivatives, right? So I have d over dx of f of x, so I get f prime of x. If the x hits the second term, I get plus i y f double prime of x. And then I still have, and I also have the i y, which can hit this one. This is the only place where the y appears. And this will give me a minus, minus, f uh, prime x. Okay, so those are the terms proportional to chi. And then I have and then I have the terms proportional to chi of y. And those are the terms, well, those are the terms when this partial derivatives hit, hits the chi. So it's just multiplied by that. And let me take the i inside, so I have i f of x, i times i is minus 1, minus 1 and then this is multiplied by g hat of x plus i y. Okay. This is just a simple calculation. And now you notice an important cancellation. Because these two terms cancel. And this is not a coincidence. This is, precisely, this, this is precisely coming from the fact that we chose the correct extension. We chose the almost analytic extension, which is responsible for this cancellation. So this is an instance of the Cauchy-Riemann equations, if you wish. OK, so this is our formula, and now 
now you see it looks quite tractable, right? So the left hand side is something we want to show is small. The left hand, the right hand side is the very explicit integral of these functions with, with this guy, g hat, and we have good bounds on g hat from the local law. So now it reduces to a, a, basically a very elementary calculus exercise, well not quite calculus, but analysis exercise of estimating these integrals. Uh, there's one more important observation one should make before starting this, is that the left hand side is real. The left hand side is real, so f is a real function, mu hat is a real measure, so I can take the real part of every term on the right hand side. And um, So what does that mean? So I can take the real part here, the real part of this guy, which means with the i, I have, uh, and this is all real, so that means it's i times the imaginary part of, this is real, this is real, so for the first term, only the imaginary part of g matters, right? If I write g hat, is the real part of g hat plus i times the imaginary part of g hat. The real part of g hat cannot contribute, right? Because the real part of g hat is multiplied by only by real functions and an i. And the left hand side is real. So that's gone. So I only get the imaginary part of g hat. And um, with a minus sign that comes from this. Um, If you take i times the imaginary part of this guy, you get two i's, which gives you a minus sign. <coughs> we have dx and dy. And then we have f double prime x chi of y times y times the imaginary part of g hat. Okay, so this is the first term. This is the term proportional to chi. And now for the purposes of doing the estimate, I would like to split this integral into two pieces. I would like to split it. So this is what I will call the term A. And then I have exactly the same. Um, so that's exactly the same, just uh, I, I, split it, I split this y integration into two uh, different domains. And then finally I have, um, I have the last term which is proportional to chi prime. And let me pull out the i. f of x plus I y. And here I don't really care about the real or imaginary part, so let me just keep g hat. Okay, so I get these three terms. In reality, I just have two terms, right? I have this one plus that one, but here I just I split the integration into these two different regions. Why don't you care about the real part? Well, I mean, uh, this is certainly correct, yeah? But it, you will see why I... This would also be correct without... Uh, well, this would also be correct if I hadn't done this trick with the imaginary part, right? I could have not written this... I could not have pulled this i out. I could have just left the g hat. But the observation was that the imaginary part of this whole thing is anyway going to be zero. So I can, I can ignore the imaginary parts of the individual terms. Um, if, if we ignore the imaginary part, then you're probably right. So maybe we need to. You're saying we should have a real part here. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. Then it's then it's certainly okay. Yes, I think your observation is probably correct. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Good. So let's let's look at these terms individually, and we will start by. Um, well, we'll do them individually just just before starting. So you see, the approach is straightforward, right? We we uh, we we know bounds. We have bounds on this g hat from theorem 11, so we just have to plug these bounds in, and uh, and estimate the integrals. I would like to do that carefully. You see, by the way, here, now you see already why I wanted to choose my cutoff function chi in such a way that this thing is supported, the derivative is supported far away from the real axis. Because now this integral over y is going to be very easy because y is always bounded, y is always at least one in absolute value. And then the estimates we have for this guy are very sharp, very sharp, right? They are one over n. Whereas if we had come very close, if we come, cl the, the, the danger is always getting close to the real axis. Um, but here we stay away from the real axis, so in particular term C is extremely easy to estimate, thanks to the choice of chi. In order to do the estimate, we have to go back. If you want to do this really rigorously, you have to be slightly careful. If you recall, the estimate from theorem 11 was that g hat, I can write it like this, g hat, of z and this is true uniformly in z. If you recall this does not mean a priori, it does not mean that you can find an event a very high probability such that this bound This does not imply that, right? This is for each individual z, and this is simultaneously for all z. And this is what we really need if you integrate here, right? If you want to estimate every single one of these guys, you have an uncountable number of g hats. You want to estimate all of them uh, by, by this bound. So you have an uncountable number of, of estimates you have to do. So this estimate on its own will not do. However, if you recall, we had a remark which was this distinction between uniform and simultaneous bounds, which, which told us, and you worked this out in an exercise, it told us that this actually does imply that thanks to the Lipschitz continuity of all the quantities involved. And that's, that's what we need here. So let me just remark on that. So we estimate A, B, C separately. Using, using a simultaneous bound using a simultaneous bound so this was the remark this was remark 12 and there was also an exercise on that following following from theorem 11. So more precisely, with very high probability, with very high probability for all, let's say all x bounded <coughs> by uh, and y1 over epsilon and y And y, whose absolute value is between eta and epsilon to the minus 1, we have g hat So that is the bound, the simultaneous bound that you get. If, if uh, y is positive, then this is what we had. 
Now, how can we extend our theorem 11 to negative imaginary parts? That's, that's obvious. Just take the complex conjugate. So using that, using that g hat of x minus i y, so if y is now a positive number, this is just equal to g hat of x plus i y complex conjugate, since mu is a real measure. So, so that's using this remark 12, the simultaneous bounds, and theorem 11, uh, you, get, you get this bound. And this bound, now we know with very high probability, this is true for all x and y simultaneously in, in this rectangle, or in this union of two rectangles. And this bound we will just plug in. So what we will do next time, you see the exercise is very clear. It's quite straightforward. We just bound, we, we take in absolute values, no cancellations, take in absolute values everywhere, estimate these guys by that, and uh, hope that we get something small enough. And that indeed will turn out to work just fine. Um, so we will conclude this argument carefully next time, and we will move on to the other applications then.